Good morning. This is uh, Abnormal Psychology. If you showed up for German 101, you're in the wrong place. Uh, this is lecture one. We're going to talk this morning about uh, what is uh, abnormal and what is abnormal psychology. Let me talk a little bit to begin with about the, uh, the goals or uh, purposes of this uh, course. Uh, to begin with, we're going to be reviewing the uh, traditional psychological and psychiatric disorders and uh, dysfunctions. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association has a manual called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of uh, Mental Disorders, and it has become pretty much the official listing of uh, diagnoses. And we'll sort of use that as a guide. Uh, the textbook use that, uses that as a guide to talk about the, uh, uh, the different uh, disorders. Uh, but we'll also be talking about the DSM and kind of critiquing it as a method of thinking about uh, diagnosis and, and its way of conceptualizing things. There are alternative ways of conceptualizing things. And as we go through the course, I'll talk a bit about alternative ways in which we might think of disorders, uh, alternative systems about thinking of them, as they say, as dimensions rather than as categories, and alternative ways of grouping disorders. I'll talk about the description of the disorders, and I will try to, uh, in many instances at least, give you some examples of cases from my own experience. Uh, they'll be disguised and uh, uh, combined in some instances, but uh, uh, hope to be able to talk about some real cases. Just to give you a quick bio, I did my uh, graduate work in clinical psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, did an internship at the VA in Milwaukee where I worked on an inpatient service for a year there and then worked for a couple of years. My first job was at UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute, which is the Department of Psychiatry there. And again, spent, so spent a couple more years working with inpatients in, in a serious mental illness setting. <clears throat> Since then, I've been professor first at the University of Pittsburgh and then here. And all during that time, I've uh, uh, supervised graduate students who've been seeing cases in training and uh, have had a small uh, private practice of my own. So I've got have to count them up 30 some years of uh, uh, seeing uh, various uh, uh, patients and so we'll try to give you some more real life descriptions of examples of some of these disorders. We'll talk about the epidemiology and demographics of the disorder, that is who tends to uh, develop the disorder, what's the incidence in the general uh, population, what is the general, what is the age at which these disorders tend to first uh, uh, appear, uh, etc. Uh, and we'll also try to talk a bit about the etiology or causes of the disorder. What's, what do we know uh, either theoretically or empirically from the research about uh, factors that contribute to the origins of the disorder? Uh, and this will include biological, psychological, and environmental. Uh, and this will be kind of a theme through the course is to look at this, the kind of the three dimensions of uh, uh, cause and effect here. What's the, what are the biological risk factors, the environmental risk factors, and the psychological risk factors? And what are the biological, psychological, and uh, environmental implications of the disorders? Uh, and finally, we'll talk about treatment implications. This is not a course about uh, uh, psychotherapy, but uh, uh, when we talk about how we conceptualize the disorder, that conceptualization leads to then, what would you do about the disorder? How would you intervene? How would you try to uh, modify or ameliorate the, the problem? So there are always implications for treatment. Second kind of theme for the course is, uh, abnormal psychology and psychology in general as a kind of scientific endeavor. Talk about how we, uh, how we study these disorders, uh, how we learn about them, how we conceptualize them, what are the assumptions underlying our conceptual systems, uh, what paradigms, uh, theories, and models uh, 
uh, are, do people use to think about uh, the disorder, and how does theory influence how we look at disorders? If we take a behavioral perspective or a cognitive perspective, how do we uh, understand or think about, or biological perspective, uh, the particular disorder? Uh, when we talk about disorders, we often have a kind of an implicit theory. We're making certain assumptions, and often we're not aware of those assumptions, and part of the idea to talk about this is to try to be aware of, of the assumptions we're making when we think about uh, disorders. I like your textbook in part because it tries to be integrative. Rather than saying this is the biological approach and this is the uh, psychological approach and this is the kind of environmental approach, it, it tries to put them together and, and uh, talks about how, the inter, how they interact, how uh, biological risk may interact with uh, psychological factors and that these may, uh, under stress from the environment, produce the particular uh, disorder. Uh, why is the material in this course important and why, should you, uh, my, why might you want to be here? Uh, taking this course. Well, uh, some of you may, uh, may be interested in careers in mental health. Uh, let me just, about a show of hands, uh, people who are thinking, okay, yes, yeah, some people who want to uh, go on in this area. And some of you may already be involved in some form of uh, uh, mental health uh, work. Uh, so f for some of you, it'll be a, a kind of a precursor and a beginning uh, introduction uh, to the topic that you'll be involved in later. If you're not, uh, sometime in your life, if you haven't already, you are likely to encounter true examples of abnormal psychology and abnormal behavior uh, amongst friends, family, coworkers, uh, even yourself. Uh, and having some basic knowledge about uh, uh, approaches uh, may help you to respond, to be helpful, to make choices, to be helpful, uh, etc. Uh, beware of being quick to diagnose. I, uh, there's a tendency when you take this course to say, aha, I knew my Uncle Joe was, uh, you know, uh, fit this diagnosis. Uh, or the medical student's syndrome is to find every diagnosis in yourself and uh, decide that you have 16 clinical uh, diagnoses as you go through the, uh, as you go through the, uh, the book. But some awareness, I think, uh, is, is a valuable tool in life in general. Uh, in addition, uh, we're all uh, citizens in a society that deals with mental health. There's mental health systems, there's private systems, and there's public systems for dealing with uh, mental health in the city, the county, the state, uh, etc. And uh, we sometimes are faced with issues in policies with regard to uh, 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 how we as a society are going to deal with different uh, uh, issues. Uh, do we want a halfway house in our neighborhood or uh, do you really want to live next to the uh, uh, Harris County Psychiatric Clinic over there? Or uh, what, are we do what are we doing with uh, uh, our homeless? Uh, and uh, would note here that at the moment, the prison system in Texas is the largest provider of mental health services uh, uh, in the state. Uh, this is a public policy issue as to how we deal with uh, mental health uh, problems. Uh, it also has implications for violence and crime, for certainly for the prison system, uh, and for issues of health and medicine. Uh, behavioral, psychological health has lots of implications for physical health and vice versa. Uh, how are mind and body interrelated in the development of disorders? Uh, abnormal psychology and the law, we'll talk about a little bit at the end of the course in particular about uh, insanity pleas and competence to stand trial and what this means and how uh, legal definitions uh, may or may not fit with psychological uh, definitions. 
Okay, a, uh, a typical way to start out with the course is to define the material. What is abnormal and what is abnormal psychology? And I'm not going to do that, at least not uh, yet. I'm going to uh, ask you, I'm going to give you some case examples and ask you what is it about this case that makes it abnormal? I don't want, I don't want a diagnosis. We may know what the diagnosis is. But what, why is it that we label something uh, as abnormal? And the first example, uh, uh, a person is constantly worried about germs and contamination. Wash their hands 60 times a day for five minutes each with very hot water, wears gloves uh, during a lot of the other time and changes gloves frequently. It occurred to me that I could have just skipped that and said, what about Tony Shalhoub on Monk? Um, <laughs> on uh, TV. Why would we think that his behavior or uh, a, a hand washer that I'm describing is abnormal? Remember, push your button to, to speak. Anybody? Okay. You press the button. On the little, there's a microphone on your, okay. When the green light's on, you're on. It's on the flat part in the front, so it says push. You have to hold it down. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll hold it. Okay. Um, well, his actions aren't necessary, like, just to live. He doesn't have to do all of those things just to live okay. his normal life. Necessary to. I'm starting out with misspellings already. Necessary. All right. Uh, any other ideas? It would interfere socially. Okay, good. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> I become completely unable to spell when I have to do it. <laughs> Any other thoughts? What what makes this abnormal? How about because it's extremely excessive behavior? Okay. <clears throat> Any other on this one? Well, as Dr. Phil says, he says anything that's not normal is something that disrupts your daily life or something like okay, that. Okay, disrupts daily life. Okay, any other thoughts on this one? Let me give you another example here. This uh, is a postcard size thing that was handed out on a street corner to a roommate of mine in college. I'm gonna read it to you. Uh, what, dear citizen, what I, write effect, what I write affects your most intimate action. The government has had for eight months the, quote, all-seeing eye mind reader. I know because I reported it to intelligence. It sees for miles into your office or bedroom. It reads minds, thought images, and picks up voice audio for miles. From this equipment, no secret is hidden. I have been persecuted by the government for reporting this to intelligence. They have raped my mind of valuable thoughts and ideas. Why and who is keeping the Los Angeles Police Department and just plain John Doe or a lawyer, merchant, stockbroker, gambler, contractor, or businessman from having a mind reader? Who gets the money for crushing, and I cut out the name here, who stopped uh, X uh, correspondence to Washington? Apparently been writing to Washington about this and somebody stopped the correspondence. Will you be persecuted for mentioning the mind reader or for questioning the government? 
who sought to alienate X from his relatives, friends, and associates. Somehow people are not reacting well to him. Uh, any electronics man can understand the Mazer. I know because I had electronics in the Air Force. I know how they had the all-seeing eye and mind reader in the, in the government, and I defy the government to deny this. I solicit help, monetary or otherwise, from any quarter in bringing about a public announcement, public demonstration of the all-seeing eye and mind reader and the audio mind conditioner. Those who have the all-seeing eye and mind reader on me now may be guilty of treason. And then it says, if they're not the government, let the government stop them. Please call the Russ Hotel. Mail does not seem to be getting through. That is, the checks aren't coming in the mail to support his fight against the all-seeing eye mind reader. Is that abnormal? Lots of people stand on street corners and hand out postcards out with things they'd like you to donate to. What makes this one, what makes us think that there might be some abnormal process going on here? <coughs> Nobody thinks it's abnormal? Okay. Any? Um, do we have the whole Get it pressed? Oh, I was going to say that I don't necessarily think that he's abnormal, a little eccentric or extreme, but um, it might be just something how he's viewing reality. That might be, he's not viewing it the same way everybody else does. Okay, so we've got something here about his view of reality. It's not quite right somehow. Anybody else want to take a shot at this one? There's a sense of paranoia about it, like he's paranoid about everything. Okay, uh, good diagnosis, but, and I'll put it down, but why do we say paranoia? What, what, what's, paranoia is a type of abnormality. What makes paranoia abnormal? Well, it seems like he's just like culturally not in tune with what everyone else is thinking. So he's thinking okay. not like everyone else. It's not typical okay. behavior. Not thinking like others. Anybody else? He's asking people to act um, in a way that most people would find unreasonable. Okay. So, uh, getting ready, getting used to this pen. Okay. Any other thoughts? What what makes this example? Why do we? They, this is, you know, it's, it's something like, the, you know, there's the famous, whatever, Supreme Court justice who said of pornography, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. This, this, where there's a little bit of this quality in here, you know it when you see it, but why do we, why do we know it? Why, what, what is it that makes us uh, say, boy, that guy, I want to stay away from him? It's the uh, conspiracy of it, I think. It, he feels like the society is conspiring against him or against a group of people specific okay. around him. So there's a, he, he sees a conspiracy of, of society. Anybody else? Okay, uh, just to give you another kind of common example, uh, a person who can't leave home except with, let's, well, let's make it a woman who can't leave home except with her husband to go to the store, shopping mall, or to her mother's house. She's too fearful to go anywhere else. She has anxiety attacks, feels sick, feels like she's smothering or going to die even though she knows there's no objective danger when she goes to any place, tries to go anywhere else. What makes that abnormal?
Yes. Okay, so it uh, said not healthy, but it's also uh, what dangerous in a sense for her. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts on that one? Her fear goes outside of what we consider normal fear. This feel. Okay. So we're, what we're getting here is another another example of uh, uh, both uh, perhaps uh, disrupts daily life excessive. It's 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 a fear is bigger than it should be. Somehow we don't uh, see that. Uh, let me give you another slide here. What about this one? It's another thing that I I think found in my mailbox one time. Spenders and Debtors Anonymous. This is a 12-step program for people who run up their charge cards. Should that be abnormal psychology? Is, it, is that? Or is that just poor planning? I think it could depend on how much they're spending and what they're spending it on. Like if they're um, seeming to have to spend money that would be different than just buying things because they think they're pretty or something. Okay, so uh, it, it's a, what, a, not in their control, a need or something like that? It could be. I mean, it depends on the person that you're talking about, I guess. Okay. Uh, Anybody else have any thoughts on that example? Are you addicted to money? Do you have money problems? Can you be addicted to money? Spending can almost be like eating, obesity, like it can really get out of control. Okay, so th this, this problem, like other problems, could be considered like a, a, a control problem. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay, uh, what about an 85-year-old man who exposes himself in his front yard to a 14-year-old girl who's walking past? Pardon? Purposely? Purposely. Uh, let's say it's a, well, let's, let's ask questions. Would it make a difference if this was the first time? versus a long history of doing this. What if I said that he didn't remember it afterwards and was seemed to be confused about where he was and what time of day it was? Would those things make a difference? Well, it would certainly make a difference if he has a, a Alzheimer's or something like that and he doesn't know or doesn't remember what he does. Okay, so tell me the difference. Well, one would be on purpose and, and would show some kind of uh, moral issue or, or some kind of issue with the, with a, in a sexual nature, and one would be a, a, a pure lack of understanding what's going on. Okay, so we have here something that's a, that has to do with kind of a moral intent to violate norms. I'm raising that one, but I'm going to put down violate norms. Hard to write. The, what appears is a little bit after you've written it, so it's kind of fun. I think again, it has to do with control. If he has okay. no control about those urges, okay. or if he just doesn't realize what he's doing. Okay. A 
And I, so again, a, a different version of not in control. Uh, what about an excessive fear of snakes? Lots of people don't like snakes. I've talked to people who won't go near a lawn or grass because there just might be a snake. Won't go to the zoo at all because there might, there's a snake house there. Uh, require that somebody preview any magazine that comes into the house because there might be a picture of a snake in it. Uh, and doesn't allow anyone in the household to watch either a Western or a jungle movie because you never know when a snake might appear. Um, what's, anybody want to give a quick thought on that one? Um, maybe they had a bad experience and every time they think of a snake then they just recall on that bad experience so they get ma nightmares or fears or something. Okay, so you're, you're talking about etiology there a little bit about how to, how to explain why it might have become that way, but uh, what is that, why, how does that make it abnormal? Because they've had an, ab an unusual experience with it? They could have reoccurring um, flashbacks of that event. Okay. That could cause them to fear even more. I'm just going to put down bad experience. I'm trying to remember how to do a new sheet here. Nope. Okay, any other thoughts on the snake phobia? Um, it sounds like just, you know, loss of control. The irrational fear is controlling them again. Okay. Uh, again, we're starting to get repeats here on some topics. Uh, okay, I could give you uh, some other examples. What about suicide? That's an interesting one to debate. What about suicide bombers these days? Uh, child is angry, refuses to go to school, disruptive at, at home, doing poorly in school. Is this abnormal psychology or, you know, parent parenting problems? Uh, I've seen, I've got... Uh, this, I didn't make a slide of this. This is in uh, The National Psychologist, How to Treat Clients Addicted to the Internet. What about internet addictions? Uh, is that abnormal psychology? Uh, I also read recently, I uh, saw something on the, on the internet uh, about road rage disorder. Uh, we, should that be included in the next version of the DSM? It's not there yet. Well, let me, what I want to derive from this is to say that you've come up with now a, a little over a page of uh, uh, different thoughts about what uh, might make something abnormal. And I want to kind of present the argument to you that you can reduce this down to uh, about three different concepts that tend to be involved. One of them has to do with, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it distress to the person. And here's what we're talking about, having a lack of sense of control, feeling helpless in the face of your fear or your uh, addiction to spending or whatever it might be. People know often that their behavior is irrational uh, and excessive and uh, limits their lives, uh, but nevertheless, they continue to uh, uh, repeat th the behavior and why people behave in an, irra in an irrational uh, way is part of what we are uh, going to be talking about through the whole course. Uh, I find it uh, difficult to make it, uh, changes or control these behaviors. Albert Bandura, a well-known psychologist, once argued in a book that this should, be, this should be the only criteria. We should help people change who feel that they are distressed and 
can't control the behavior that's distressing them. He argued that, that should, that's, that's number one and that that's what abnormal psychology and psychotherapy or behavior therapy or whatever should be uh, about. Uh, we can kind of ask the question about these three things that I'm going to bring up, that's number one, is are they necessary or sufficient? Is it necessary for us to call something abnormal, let the person be stressed by it? Is it sufficient for that to uh, be a definition? The guy who was passing out the cards was probably not distressed by what we think was abnormal. You know, he was distressed about the eye seeing all mind machine, but he wasn't distressed about the fact that he believed in the all seeing all uh, seeing eye mind uh, machine. Uh, so the second criteria is, and I'm going to call it distress to others. This suggests that there's a kind of a social judgment about the appropriateness of the, of the behavior. Uh, family, friends, society in general are upset about the, uh, the exhibitionist uh, uh, and about the, uh, this uh, guy who's uh, uh, trying to solicit money because he, of the government conspiracy that we uh, are doubtful about. Uh, part of what's uh, distressing to us or makes it uh, seem unusual in a, as a social judgment is the fact that it's inexplicable. That is, there's a, uh, we can't attribute it to normal motives. We don't uh, understand why the person can only go to the store uh, with her husband and is too fearful to walk down the block uh, otherwise alone. That's beyond our normal understanding of motives. We don't uh, uh, see the danger that uh, she seems to see in those kinds of, of situations. You know, we understand behavior that may be to avoid real dangers or uh, we understand behavior that involves gratification or profit or self validation, but uh, we don't understand uh, excessive forms of that, of, of some of those things. Uh, excessive forms, the exhibitionist again, or the alcoholic, or the, uh, if, we, if we extend the analogy, the spender, uh, uh, et cetera. In some instances, this is, uh, well, we see a, a violation of social norms. That they're doing something not only that it's inexplicable, but it's uh, sort of against our ordinary uh, rules. It's uh, negative. And there's a, one of the themes we'll talk about is the stigma of mental illness uh, and various attempts th uh, through the history of talking about abnormal behavior and mental illness to reduce the stigma. Well, perhaps there's always uh, some uh, uh, stigmatization process that goes on because uh, we're, because it's a violation of norms, because it's something that's outside of our expectations, and so there's always a sign of a negative cast to it. Now this is uh, greater in some instances than uh, in others. Here we come again to one of the borders of what is, uh, what do we consider abnormal psychology versus what do we consider moral deviance, what do we consider criminal behavior, uh, it's an interesting discussion we'll get into. Uh, 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 child molestation is in the diagnostic manual as a, uh, uh, as a disorder, but uh, molesting sexually an adult is not. Uh, and there was a, a real decision made that we don't want to we don't want to give someone an excuse to explain away. Uh, uh, sexual assault, uh, but why do we do it with children? Why do we have a diagnosis in there, there for children? Is, is, you know, and some things may be criminal as well as being diagnosable uh, uh, in a sense. And so there, there's a, uh, a border there that we sometimes dis disagree about. Uh, and again, notice that some behaviors are distressing because of their excesses, uh, alcoholism. Others, in a, in a sense, because of their deficits. 
the inability to do things that normal uh, people do. Third criteria is that things are, and these are in some ways overlapping, but uh, maladaptive or dysfunctional. And this is an attempt to be somewhat more uh, objective about a definition, to think in more objective terms, although it may in fact be nothing more than another way of saying distressing to others uh, in that it, it always, always tends to involve some social judgment. Uh, statistically deviant would be part of this. Inappropriate to time and place, which is, says that it's, an, that it's a relative thing. Uh, if, you're, if you uh, sing arias to yourself uh, loudly, and you do so as a farmer out on your tractor in the middle of the field, we probably don't consider that abnormal. If you're a taxi driver and you start singing loudly when you have passengers in your uh, taxi, we might start wondering what's going on here. This person is not, that's not their role to be singing. Uh, it's not appropriate to the time and, uh, and place. Uh, this starts to get us also into talking about the difference between sort of qualitative and quantitative models of uh, deviance. Some things are a different kind of behavior. Uh, some of the uh, psychotic behavior, uh, when, if somebody tells you they're hearing voices in their head and uh, they know that the voices are inside their head uh, uh, and it's, I uh, uh, talked to a woman one time who uh, said she was receiving messages from the planet Venus that were being transferred through a crystal at the bottom of the ocean and she wanted to tell people about these important messages. Uh, that's qualitatively different. That's a different kind of, uh, of thinking and we're pretty much sure, although I used that once an example and somebody in the class said, well, maybe, maybe she was, how do you know that she wasn't? In any case, that's a qualitative thing versus something that might be quantitative, that might be just a matter of degree. The fear of snakes. Again, lots of people have a little fear of snakes. They're not really comfortable with uh, uh, picking up a snake or something like that. But it's a matter of degree. How much does it interfere with your life, etc. cetera? Uh, notice that medical diseases, by and large, are qualitative. You either have the germ, uh, the flu, uh, virus or you don't, but some disorders in medicine are quantitative. High blood pressure is uh, a kind of arbitrary cutoff as to at what point is your blood pressure considered to be uh, high. And we have some of the same kinds of issues in uh, abnormal psychology. There have been some attempts, and let me see where I am in this, to uh, kind of write single uh, phrases. These are the three things that I've just talked about. Distress to the person, distress to others, maladaptive. Uh, Wakefield used this phrase, unexpectable harmful dysfunction. And he's kind of got it, most of the things that I'm just talked about in there. Unexpectable is the idea that it doesn't fit our expectations, our understanding of, remember, we, can't, we have difficulty explaining it. Uh, it's not what we expect. It's harmful, uh, so there's a negative social judgment about it, and it's dysfunctional, meaning that it's probably uh, uh, leading to uh, problems for the person. Your text, Barlow and Durand, uh, have psychologically, psychological dysfunction associated with distress. Again, personal distress could be distress of others. Impairment in functioning that is not a typical or culturally expected response. And again, you get the same kind of elements in this uh, definition. Uh, I'd like to point out again that, that we have difficulty here deciding or being able to say what's absolutely necessary to calling something abnormal and, and what's sufficient. Uh, in some instances, one of these things may be sufficient. 
uh, distress to the person uh, uh, may be sufficient to define uh, uh, phobias of certain kinds. People may uh, uh, function all right. I've known people who fly on airplanes but have this terrible fear of flying and uh, uh, knew a woman, I talked to a woman one time who uh, she flew but it sort of wiped her out for three days. She, she needed a day of kind of preparation where she couldn't do anything because she was so anxious before the flight. The day of the flight she'd take a couple of Valium and maybe a couple of drinks on the plane, then a day to recover from all of that, uh, so that she would go uh, traveling when her, with her husband when he went places, but she always figured a three-day window for, for uh, a flight. Now, so she's functioning, but functioning maybe not too well, but she's uh, uh, very distressed. And so her personal distress certainly would be sufficient in that instance. And again, in other instances, the person may not be distressed, but others are distressed about the behavior. Uh, we get into issues of, of uh, uh, what are people's rights, what are just odd or eccentric uh, uh, behaviors, uh, what are the boundaries with medical disorders, with legal issues, with moral issues, and with changing social norms? We do have uh, changing ideas sometimes about what is abnormal. New things get added. That tends to be the, the tendency in the DSMs from one edition to the next in the diagnostic uh, list. But some things also get taken out. Uh, we do have things that are subtracted up. And we'll uh, talk a little bit later on, for instance, about the history of homosexuality uh, and when it was uh, uh, a diagnosis and how society's change in view uh, led to changes in the diagnostic system. I also want to point out that there are special purpose definitions uh, that kind of aren't included in what I've just talked about for certain purposes in the legal area, again, you have insanity. Uh, insanity is a legal term and it's not a, not a psychological term and it has its own, uh, its own parameters and its own definitions about understanding uh, right from wrong and what you're doing and this sort of thing. Competence to stand trial is another legal, uh, uh, has a history of legal precedent about what it means. Uh, and it goes back to the idea that you should be able to be present when you are uh, involved in a court proceeding. If you're accused of a crime or whatever, you should be present. And the question is, are you mentally present? Can you be mentally present to uh, assist in your own uh, defense? And uh, not competent to stand trial means that you're not competent to be mental. You're not mentally present. You're not able to... Uh, uh, do the things you need to do to defend yourself. Uh, research uh, often has uh, other, many other kinds of uh, special purpose uh, uh, definitions uh, having to do with, with uh, whether you, your history, your history of hospitalizations, your history of, of disorders, or with uh, things like your past response you know, see studies of uh, tricyclic antidepressant responsive depressives versus non-responsive uh, people who have responded to one medication as if we're now trying to look to see what's the difference between the people who do respond and who people who don't respond to some particular medication. We also have other uh, interesting ideas brought over from medicine and we'll talk about the how the medical model gets applied here. Uh, managed care has the idea that uh, what should be paid for in a managed care system is returning you to your prior normal level of functioning. Not making you better, but bringing you back to baseline. So that if at baseline you weren't doing fairly well, all they need to do is bring you back to baseline. Uh, uh, and that'll be, uh, you know, sort of, uh, again, what they'll reimburse is the ultimate idea. But uh, return of function is, uh, is a concept that sometimes 
leads to difficulties when we attempt to apply it to psychopathology. I think I've got, oop, nope. Uh, well, let me kind of wind up this topic by uh, saying uh, that we have these various components of what's abnormal, inexplicable, social deviance, etc. Uh, societies need to deal with these problems. Uh, we need to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, problematic behavior uh, and various societies have different limits as to kind of what's tolerable, uh, etc. And we'll talk about some interesting examples of that. Societies change their view. Uh, we tend to be having an increase in the number of things that we tend to see. Uh, particularly in the area of things like addictions, again, uh, internet addiction, etc. Uh, we change in our uh, views of things. Uh, tobacco is now listed in the uh, abuses, abusive substances in the DSM. Uh, so society has certainly changed its view over the last decade or two about smoking. Question, comment? Is any kind of addiction considered abnormal? I couldn't quite hear you. Is, is any kind of addiction considered abnormal? Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, what, what we seem to be doing is applying this concept of addiction to more and more things. And it, it, it's, what are the limits of it? And that's a topic, actually, you just, uh, uh, Sort of that's your first term paper, is to tell me what you think about uh, such things. Uh, and not, not to, um, we'll go into this more when we talk later about substance abuse. But what, what happened is there was an initial definition of addiction that said you had to have with withdrawal and tolerance defined addiction. But then the DSM people decided to expand that and they put in a whole list of other criteria that you spend a lot of your time uh, uh, planning how you're going to get your supply of the substance. That you, uh, uh, you drink more than you intended or you do more of the activity than you, in than you intended. Uh, and once you start adding those kinds of criteria, then you can apply it to more and more things. Uh, can you have a jogging addiction? I ran farther than I really intended this morning. I spent a lot of time thinking about when I'm going to be able to go jogging again. Do I have an addiction? Uh, I, I, I jogged instead of fulfilling my uh, social obligations to someone else. Uh, the, the, the addictions is a particularly kind of problematic area because you can apply these new criteria to uh, just about anything, and people are coming up with new things almost uh, every week, it seems. Uh, so that's so we're in a in an issue of definition uh, and and of sort of where do we set the limits of of how we apply this. Uh, there are lots of other areas. An interesting discussion going on these days in the research on post-traumatic stress disorder. The old criteria said that it had to be a trauma that is outside of ordinary experience. Well, then they sort of made, made the argument that unfortunately there are lots of traumas that are not that uncommon that produce PTSD symptoms. Well, now we're getting PTSD uh, over all sorts of things, secondhand PTSD from being exposed to somebody who is exposed to uh, uh, danger and all sorts of other kind of extensions of the, uh, of the concept. And uh, partly it's a, it's, it is indeed a matter of definition. Where do you set the criteria? Uh, the criteria uh, in, the, in the DSM often are lists of symptoms and you have to have a certain number out of, the, out of that list. Uh, if you define depression as having five out of nine symptoms, what happens if you say, well, maybe you really only need four? How, 
how many more people to you do you add to the pool of the depressed when you when you make that quantitative uh, decision to change the the nature of the criteria? Uh, these uh, uh, there there are kind of continuing arguments about uh, all of this, and there are shifts. Actually, it, it, I haven't done this tape to this course for a couple of years. I haven't taught it, so it. It really kind of surprised me as I'm going through my notes, the number of things that have changed, the number of uh, uh, conceptualizations or the, or the research that has added uh, a new fact or a different way of looking at uh, some of the disorders just within the last uh, couple of years. This is, a, this is an evolving topic and uh, what we include and don't include and what uh, uh, what we consider within this topic. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Thomas Zaz, who said we're moving towards universal patienthood. Uh, you know, if you look at the epidemiological studies, uh, something like 20% of people uh, may have a disorder at the moment. That means one in five, look around you. Uh, uh, that seems like a lot to me. Uh, what should it be? But you know, where should we set the cutoff? In a sense, is what we're talking about. We think we tend to think in qualitative, discrete category terms. You have the disorder or you don't. But really, there are lots of uh, continua involved in this. Well, uh, I'm going to kind of switch topics here and. Uh, start into the topic, give you the introduction to the topic of talking about theories and paradigms, paradigms. I tend to pronounce it paradigms or paradigms. The dictionary accepts both. I had a, a course feedback one time. Why does it keep saying paradigms when it's words paradigm? So I'll try to say paradigm. Uh, we understand disordered behavior through various kinds of paradigms and theories and models. A paradigm is a broad set of assumptions about how a science is conducted. How should we look at the topic? What are our basic assumptions about the nature of the topic? Within a particular paradigm, there may be different theories. They may accept, accept the basic assumptions about how you study the topic but there may be different, more specific theories. The, uh, kind of classic example of this is, uh, we all have know a little bit about this from the history of astronomy. Although the idea that the sun was the center of the solar system and things, uh, had really been around for uh, many centuries, uh, there tended in Europe uh, to be the belief held partly by the church that the uh, the earth uh, oops. the earth all right, what am I doing here? I can't get the earth here. Did I press the button again? No. Nope. All right. Imagine the Earth. Uh, and the, th the thought that it's the center of the universe. Well, that works pretty well. It works great for the moon. Works pretty well for the sun. We see the sun rise and set in a very regular way. Works pretty well for the stars. Uh, problem is the planets. The planets do strange things in their motion through the skies if we think that they're circling around the Earth. And there are various theories about that. People accepted the paradigm. We're at the center of the universe. They're circling around us. How can that be that they go back and forth in these strange ways? Well, there are various theories of epicycles. Their orbit goes like this, or it's like that. It's, they had different, there were different ideas about uh, uh, that they tried to fit to predict the, uh, the way in which the planets moved in the sky by this. Then you had people come along and start to question this. 
Galileo started looking through a telescope. He saw moons revolving around Jupiter. That doesn't work if everything's supposed to be revolving around the, uh, the, the Earth. He looked at Venus and saw phases of Venus like phases of the moon. Well, that doesn't work if, again, if they're both uh, rotating around us. Uh, and the actual uh, more definitive one, uh, you hear less about uh, Tycho Brahe was a, I think, a Danish uh, nobleman, lived on an island, his own island, and he uh, had a telescope, a very good telescope, and he took very careful uh, uh, observations. Every night kept observations about when things rose and, and where they were in the sky and such. Uh, the other thing I remember about Tycho Brahe is he had a silver nose. He'd been in a duel and someone cut off his nose and so he had a silver, uh, sterling silver nose made to replace it. Uh, he made the observations, but he didn't have the math to figure that out. He gave his observations to Johann, Johann Kepler and Kepler started to fit these measurements to the models, to test the, the models and the theories. It didn't work that uh, you, you couldn't predict from the usual theory, you couldn't predict the planets. So he started trying to do a paradigm shift and look at a different, from a different paradigm. What if the sun is at the center and the earth and the planets are rotating around the sun? Aha, things start to fit. Except the other, th the, the theory that Kepler went to when he shifted paradigms was this is God's creation. All orbits must be perfect circles, right? That's, that's theory. So now he starts trying to fit his measurements to perfect circles. It doesn't work. They're not perfect circles. And those, so he now he has to come up with a new theory and look at parabolic uh, 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 orbits. And aha, now the data uh, seem to fit. So. We, we have this as an example of what is thought of as sort of the process of science. We have a paradigm, and uh, Kuhn talks about revolutions in science, K-U-H-N. And what Kuhn says is you have a paradigm, and you have normal science operating under that paradigm. People are making their observations, and they're studying things within the idea that uh, the Earth is the, is the center. And then along comes some, uh, some data that draws this into question. We focus our attention on those data. We focus our attention on those problems with this approach. And then we, somebody comes along with a new paradigm. And we, there's a paradigm clash. Uh, there tend to be proponents of one paradigm versus the other, and evidence is collected, and the new paradigm wins over. Well, uh, that's the model of what it should be like and how science should progress. Doesn't always. It's an interesting book by uh, Michael Mahoney called Scientist as Subject. Does science really proceed this way? Are we always convinced and move from one paradigm to the other on the basis of fact. Well, not always. One of the examples I remember his giving is there were, when before we landed on the moon, there were two d different, very distinct theories about the nature of moon rocks. Type, they were of type A or they were of type B, and two sides held their views very strongly and argued with another about what the nature of the moon was. We sent somebody up there. They picked up some moon rocks, brought them back. We looked at them. They're type A. The type B people said, ah, you went to some really weird place on the moon to find those rocks. The rest of the moon is going to be made up of type B uh, rocks. Science, the facts don't always uh, persuade, and we tend to have people who hold on to uh, theories. Well. Unfortunately, that's very much the case in psychology. 
we have multiple paradigms and sort of one paradigm doesn't replace another it sort of gets added to the list and we and we have uh, multiple paradigms we have psychodynamic paradigms and biological and behavioral and cognitive uh, ways of talking about the science and how we should approach thinking about uh, psychology in general and abnormal psychology uh, in uh, particular uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of review of those uh, I think in the next uh, lecture uh, and talk about how uh, they they have different ways of looking but also and again along with the theme of the textbook how we can think of kind of integrating uh, pers uh, the different perspectives uh, another comment I want to make in general about uh, theories and paradigms is that they are all their metaphors or analogies we are saying that this one thing functions as if it were like this other thing we make little models of the universe and say this is a this is a model of how things uh, uh, function and we think about the universe through our uh, models think of a theory as being like a map it's an abstraction of certain aspects of something uh, if you get a road map if you go to downtown Houston there aren't really blue and red lines there 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 are streets but we abstract them as different kinds of lines and that's an abstraction that's very useful it helps us to predict and and control and get where we want to go uh, there are limits because abstractions are always abstractions for per for certain purposes uh, I remember when I moved to Pittsburgh I uh, wanted to go to a certain address looked it up on the map here was this street there's a street right next to it and this street was easy to get to but this one seemed odd that you had to go way around this way so well let's go here and then I can just go over a block well I went there and there's a reason you couldn't go over a block this was on a cliff about 300 feet above the street uh, below so you couldn't just find a little uh, cross street they didn't abstract the cliff in the road map they just abstracted the uh, uh, the streets and theories are like that they abstract certain things they focus on certain things they decide what's important now if you wanted to drill for oil you wouldn't want a street map you'd want some kind of uh, geological uh, map about the strata of the earth and such in different locations to think uh, uh, so you can think of different kinds of maps being abstractions for different purposes and different theories sort of do that or different paradigms they they their decisions about what's important and what to abstract and how that will help us to get around in uh, the topic of our uh, in, uh, interest these theories and abstractions then influence how we think about things influenced how I thought about roads that I thought were going to be right next to each other we sort of see things sometimes through our models we assume that that uh, uh, every instance is a uh, is a, going to be a perfect instance of our model uh, of something uh, our models become sort of lenses through which we think see things and we we make distinctions as a function of our uh, our con concepts and our models and theories uh, natural language is like that we uh, let's uh, finish reading an interesting uh, book by uh, Marvin Melvin Bragg uh, called uh, the autobiography of the English language something kind of like that and he talks about how English evolved and how words evolved and how different people even within the English would would make different kinds of distinctions and how words came to mean different things for uh, different groups of English speakers uh, we know that different societies for instance have break up colors slightly differently 
Uh, some, uh, the, the whole red-orange spectrum is one color. Others, other societies might break it up into maybe three colors while we break it up uh, into two. The Eskimos uh, don't have a, a word for snow. They have 13 words for snow. They see very distinct different snows. Uh, our constructs and theories in psychology similarly influence how we see things, how we uh, define things, how we diagnose uh, disorders. And I will stop there and we'll pick up the topic of models uh, historically in psychology in the next lecture.